Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar from the Institute of Export and International Trade about preparing exporters for the migration from Chief to CDS, brought to you in partnership with Customs for Trade. My name is William Barnes Graham, the Executive Editor at the Institute, and I will be your host today. And for those of you who are not yet acquainted with them, Customs for Trade automates and simplifies customs management, bridging the gap between businesses and customs authorities. And you may be asking, why are we doing more webinars on CDS? Of course, last year we ran a series of webinars about the deadline for importers to start using CDS, a deadline which is now passed, of course. We're now beginning a similar program of activity to support exporters to also make the switch ahead of their deadline of the 30th of November 2023. This webinar marks the start of that program. But on the next slide, you'll see we have two fantastic speakers today. We're glad to be joined again by Matt Fick, a trade and customs specialist at the Institute, who is leading on the organization's training and support around CDS, and will be a familiar face to those of you who joined several of our webinars last year. We're also delighted to welcome Sam Blakeman, a product marketing manager at Customs for Trade, who, as you can see from the slide, has a lot of experience supporting businesses of various sizes and sectors uh, through software solutions. So you're definitely in really safe hands today with Sam and Matt, and we look forward to hearing more about Customs for Trade support for firms about uh, preparing for CDS later on too. But on the next slide, before we get going today, I'm going to launch a quick poll to find out a little bit more about you, our audience. So the poll here is asking, how do you currently submit declarations to HMRC? Uh, maybe you sell file, you might do it for an intermediary, so that could be an agent or a broker. Uh, you might use a mixture of self-filing and using an intermediary. You may not submit declarations at all. You may not even be sure. So feel, please feel free, feel free to answer as honestly as you can there. While you're answering that poll, just some quick housekeeping notes from me. Firstly, you can contact me with any comments or questions using the question panel on the control window. And that's usually to the right-hand side of your screen. We hope to get to any number of your questions today. So please note, we cannot guarantee we will get to every question in the allocated time. And some tips on the questions. Firstly, if they are short and clear, I'm more likely to be able to read them. And secondly, we do try to uh, prioritize questions which are relevant to the wider audience. So we will not be going into company specific or sector specific uh, inquiries as such. Finally, you will receive a recording of a webinar along with a copy of the slides in a follow-up email we will be sending over the next day or so. But I am now going to close the poll. Thank you everyone for responding as ever. So over half of you use an intermediary uh, and 7% of you use an intermediary and self file. A quarter of you just self file. Uh, and then only a few of you either don't submit declarations or are not sure. I mean, Matt, uh, to bring you in at this point, any surprises there with that response? Uh, not really to us. I think, I think we have in the last, couple of years I would say seen the self file actually tick up a little bit but the uh, proliferation of intermediaries is is not surprising we've seen generally speaking most people for various reasons be it internal resource knowledge etc will, will usually defer to agents sometimes it's just easier because your agent is probably doing your transport for you so no, no no surprises there it's always fun seeing the not sure um sort of interesting to know why that's the case uh, it might be that there's a, a difficulty they're classifying on who's doing the entry whether it's an intermediary for them or if they've got another team in house that might be doing it, for instance. But yeah, it's it's nice to see about 25% self filing, um, particularly for a series like this. Um, you know, it, generally speaking, they're going to require more information and, and more knowledge. Uh, but you know, it's it's one of them that's, that's usually a big barrier to even getting involved in it to start with. So yeah, good, interesting and promising results compared to probably a couple of years ago, I would say. Yeah, so I think the shift, uh, I'll have to look back at the, the data from a couple of years ago, but uh, I think there has been a small shift towards more self-filing over the last couple of years. But um, just before I hand over to you, Matt, it might just be worth bringing your mic just slightly closer uh, to your mouth. It's sure. slightly quiet. Uh, but on the next slide, without any further ado, it's my delight to hand over to you for the first part of the, of the webinar. So over to you, Matt. Yeah, thanks, Will. Um, yes, I, I did do a bunch of webinars last year, so some of you are probably sick of seeing my face, but there you go. Um, I'm just going to go over a section here on, just for everyone's benefit, recapping what CDS is, 
why it matters uh, and how it's sort of led to where we are today. Following that, we'll have a bit of a section on lessons learned and, and so on as promised. So uh, next slide, please. So next one, let's get on to the first content. So in terms of what CDS is, uh, primarily it's above, and all, above all really the replacement for the old Chief system. Uh, Chief was the software, if you will, that basically every trader or every agent that submits an entry would have to interact with. That system is interfaced with by HMRC and to a degree other government departments. Uh, but for a few reasons, uh, mostly it's age and a few others that we'll come into in a second, uh, CDS has had to basically phase out the old chief system uh, and replace it. So it's worth pointing out that CDS has been technically live since about 2018 when they did the first soft launch of it. Uh, it came to more prominence in, uh, well, basically immediately post-Brexit with the uh, Northern Ireland protocol kicking in, uh, so 2021-ish, um, because that was used for the dual tariff system that was really not capable of being handled by Chief. So anything, I, this is not counting the Windsor framework, which has just come through, but anything going into the Northern Ireland was either at risk uh, or not. So at risk meaning that it could go into the Republic uh, and therefore you know, basically had to apply EU customs measures. But that dual tariff, so basically UK customs and EU customs meant that they actually needed something like CDS in order to be able to facilitate those two different systems. So. It's it's been live for yeah a little while now, and that was a bit of a source of comfort when it came to them launching the import side a bit last year, because it wasn't completely fresh. Um, they had had a little bit of time to, you know, iron out the issues as it were. As we'll come on to in a bit, there were still some definitely, um, but CDS by and large, incidentally, is based on a big old legislation. Which if we go to the next slide, please. Uh, it's called the Union Customs Code. So when we were EU members, there was a a big old raft of changes that were drafted to uh, sort of update and change how the UK customs, well, the whole EU's customs system worked. Uh, so 2013, they passed the what would become the Union Customs Code. Uh, in 2016, we basically agreed and that was all passed in. So pretty much every EU country needs to adopt the measures that were outlined in this Union Customs Code. So Quite an important thing to note because it effectively means that there's a degree of standardization across all the states that adopted it but in a weird kind of twist the uk is actually one of the first to design a new software that accounts for this system that being cds um, ireland i believe has done theirs which is ais for the import side um, but a lot of the other countries we're, we're waiting on their version so the Union customs code the, the general point of it was to modernize customs because we were based on a previous legislation that was called the Community Customs Code. And ultimately that was paper-based. So if you wind back the clock a few decades, the way customs generally worked was that you had a bit of paper, often had to be you know, filled out, hand, handwritten as it were, handed into a customs office in order to kill a goods. This was all you know, prior to the 80s. Um, following that, we got a, a standardized document for that process called the SAD or Single Administrative Document. Uh, other people more commonly know it today as the C88. Um, but what effectively Chief and the Community Customs Code were was a software that filled in that paperwork. Um, you know, instead of doing it handwritten and basically physically moving it from desk to desk, as it were, um, they just computerized it. So at the end of the day, when you really boiled it down, Chief was still based on filling out a paper sheet with a bunch of boxes. So CDS was a big change in that it switched that to being digitally based. So to the extent that you don't have a C88 anymore, not really. Um, it's all designed to be, you input the data digitally, that is all transmitted digitally, and it's all um, processed and handled in that manner. So that was the real main thrust of the Union Customs Code. That, and again, there was a, an effort to, uh, to standardize some detail. So Chief as well, the other main reason was that it was about 30 years old. So unfortunately, it's, it's, it stood the test of time, to be fair. Um, you know, for a system to be that ancient and sort of maintain its its use for that long uh, is quite a feat. But unfortunately, it did mean that basically it was inevitable it would need to be replaced. Uh, and our government was actually looking at doing so uh, around the 2010, 2012 area, even before the Union Customs Code was, was put in. So that's how we've ended up where we are with CDS. It's been a, about 10 years in the making, literally. So about 10 years ago that the legislation that would implement it was passed. Uh, and of course, we implemented it for the whole of GB last year on the import side. Um, just to note as well, as a general point of guidance, which we will have a section on that in a bit, um, the, the 
somewhat flaw in that uh, in, in us integrating the UCC directly is that when you read the guidance, it's often referencing things like EU territory or EU or union procedures. And we didn't really change that when we copied it over when we left the EU. So there's sometimes guidance which is written in a manner which says like um, method of transport at the EU border, for instance, but it doesn't mean the EU border anymore. It means the UK border. Uh, the UK government's solution to that was effectively publishing a separate legislation or a statutory instrument, which basically said in obviously more fancy terms, um, but whenever it comes up, replace the words EU territory with UK territory. So uh, an interesting issue that we had, um, but it also will make sense if you ever go and look at online government guidance. Uh, but next slide, please. So as we say, a few things uh, to bear in mind. Key changes that where you did have boxes in chief, like you know, box one, box two, and so on. That's not called that anymore. In CDS, it's called data element. So whenever you see someone refer to a data element, they're effectively referring to what used to be the box in chief. Now, on a practical level, um, when you're actually doing a CDS entry, what you're filling in is data fields on a screen, as it were, you know, more or less boxes. Um, but those of us that, that are used to chief and used to filling out data, we might accidentally slip and say, fill out X information in Y box, but obviously in, in terms of actual CDS terminology, we need to refer to data elements. So a few things to note based on that. There was a good degree of carry forward as it were. So some things that were the case in chief would continue to work in CDS um, to the extent that some data elements, even as the government guidance is written, they equate chief boxes to new CDS data elements. So you'll have box one in chief as data elements one one and one two in CDS for instance, um, but that's not always the case. Um, generally speaking, where there is a sort of translation like that, it might not be like for like anymore. So either the data you put in is ever so slightly different or the data is the same, but you enter it differently. Um, so there's a few key places like that. Um, additionally, a lot of box uh, chief boxes were split in CDS into multiple data elements. And there's generally a logic or a reason to that, which was that those boxes in chief just did loads of different functions so they made an effort in cds to effectively swap it into being one data element has one purpose and one set of data that goes into it so while that does mean in addition to some new data elements being added that there's more data elements than there were boxes um in a lot of cases as we say it's the same information it's just that it's been split and you're actually entering it in its own unique fields now so the prominent example or a couple that come to mind was uh, box 44 in chief did a lot of stuff. Um, it included authorizations, uh, additional information, uh, and various other things like that. CDS has split that out. So you've got data elements 2, 2, 2, 3, uh, and to an extent 339, for instance, which take the place of the old box 44. So that's one example. The other one that uh, a lot of people have noticed is commodity code. So Chief had an official box for a commodity code, which technically had some sub boxes. Um, in, in CDS, that's now potentially four data elements, 614, 615, 616, and 617. Um, but again, the commodity code itself has not changed. You're effectively just having to split it up. Um, in this case, if, it, if the code is 14 digits, you'd have to split it into three boxes, but um, without getting too into detail. So there's just a few key changes like that where the information is broadly similar, how you're inputting it is different. But further to that, there were some brand new data elements that didn't have a box equivalent. Um, a lot of people may have noticed, particularly for the import side, it's going to be less so for export. Um, there's a lot more information required as to finances and how you arrive at values and things like that. Um, again, we've got a couple of examples in a bit, but that was in line with a broader set of government changes where they wanted more visibility on how people were arriving at valuations for their goods and so on. Uh, but next slide, please. Hi, Matt. If I just quickly interject, I've just had a couple yeah. of people saying they're struggling to pick up on everything you're saying. So it might be a new headset, um, but it might just be worth, um, it kind of just it, it drops out a little bit when you're speaking quicker. So it might just be worth uh, evening out yeah. a little bit. But that's okay. Thank you. Fine, not a problem. Apologies, everyone. Uh, but yeah, next slide, please. So this is the lessons learned section. So we're just going to consider what happened with the implementation last year on imports uh, and what was taken from that and, and how has that been applied going forward. So on the government side, I think this is a, a big one that's had a lot of publicity. There were technical issues. Uh, there's no way around that. Uh, one of the main ones that a lot of people saw 
um, for instance, with the with the import side, was actually registering to it in the first place. I think we should be beyond that a little bit. Um, most people that would have had that problem would have since had it solved, uh, for, for instance. But we also had a few things that led to the government publishing what they called the consolidated workaround document. So there's certain features of CDS where it's asking for information that it shouldn't be, perhaps, for instance. Um, and in those cases, they acknowledge that, okay, yeah, it's, it's not working as it should. Uh, one potential way you can get around this is such and such, and that's the consolidated workaround document. Um, that's going down a little bit over time, uh, but there's a lot of issues on that document where one of the columns is expected resolution date. Um, but there's a lot of issues there where they still don't have an expected resolution date. So this in part, I think, informs their decision to delay the export implementation at all. So as a lot of you are aware, it should have come in basically this month, end of March originally. They've pushed the mandatory date back to November. Uh, and in part, that's been attributed to the fact that there were a, a, quite a few issues thrown up by the imports implementation. And government being aware of that, they just they basically had to push it back, give themselves a bit more time. So following that, there was the uh, tariff misalignment resolutions, as it were. So a somewhat secondary issue is that the guidance or the sort of the online tariff, as you look at it, has certain bits of information or says you should, you should do certain things. Um, but CDS doesn't yet reflect that. Um, to combat that, they've got a roadmap where they say they just do a bulk update to CDS every now and again, um, where they try and bring it back in line with what the guidance says versus how the system works. So that's another thing. You sometimes have this disconnect, uh, and that extends between the live system and the dress rehearsal system as well. So some people will have entries that, for example, work in the test system, they didn't quite in the live system, and it could be because there was a, a minute change um, because the TDR is only updated once a month. Uh, finally, on this slide, we've got the error codes. Um, again, there is a government published list of these error codes. And one of the problems is that initially, certainly, some of the error codes were very vague. Uh, it would say, one thing you commonly see is, for instance, data element one requires data element two, um, verbatim. That's not referring to data element one as a, as a noun, data element two, it's saying that there's a pair of data elements that filling out one means you have to fill out another, but it was so vaguely worded and it didn't tell you the specific data element. Um, that's the case on a few codes. Over time, that guidance has been updated. We are seeing a little bit more detail. But again, it was a bit of an issue, particularly early on, wherein you just had that problem of you'd get an error code on your CDS entry. It would give you the description and you would look up the error code itself if your software didn't um, perhaps give you the full description. And then you come to the realization that the error code text wasn't overly helpful. It kind of just told you there was an error. Um, but again, that's, that is improving. Um, but there are you know, a lot of error codes uh, to be aware of. And most people get the same sort of dozen, I would say. And generally speaking, the most common ones are a little bit more intelligible now. Uh, but next slide, please. Uh, when it comes to traders, this was somewhere between a government or a CDS and a trader issue. But there were recorded instances where uh, there were problems with URI numbers, particularly if a company had multiple branches. So um, for those that it might apply to, you can have a head office with a URI number that ends in trouble zero, for instance. But then you can have uh, subsidiary offices within the country where the URI number ends in 001. Um, there were some problems there in actually signing up to CDS in the first place, uh, partly because in order to sign up, you need a single URI number, you need a unique taxpayer reference and a government gateway ID. Well, sometimes the tax reference was tied to the head office and not the branch, but they wanted the branch to do its own entries. Um, that was generally solved in, in some cases. Uh, for those that did, most had to go through their HMRC um, account manager in order to actually kind of resolve and, and try and connect the two. Often it was a case of um, sorting out either a new government gateway ID for the branch and so on. Um, the other time it came up was if a company had a GB and a Northern Ireland branch, for instance, so you'd have the XI URI number in the GB. Same thing potentially there. If your company has signed up to the Northern Ireland XI part first, because chronologically that part of CDS was released earliest, um, some had issues then actually signing up their GB URI as well for the same reason. It was the registration requirements. But again, it was often a case of you had to go through to your HMRC account manager. Um, or just go through the process of 
kind of separating and sorting out your government gateway IDs and unique taxpayer references. So it was a, an interesting period, certainly. Again, I think most that had that problem have got it sorted by now. And generally speaking, I would say uh, most that are going to start to do export declarations probably got this sorted uh, in order to do their import declarations. Not everyone, because not every company does both. Um, but I, I would expect to see a little bit less of that come November. The other problem we really came into, and it was, it was a major issue raised by traders, uh, was document proof. Um, I alluded to it a minute ago, but CDS isn't based on the SAD or CATA. And the result was there wasn't actually an official document that was produced by completing a customs entry. So whereas before, even if you're using an intermediary, you could go to them and say, hey, can you send me the CACA? I just need proof that you've done the entry. It'd be no problem because Chief by default produced one. It was standardized. Every software kind of had to output one uh, and therefore you can get sent a copy, no problem. Uh, with CDS, the fact that there is no sort of standard one, a lot of software developers, um, in the end, largely through their association called the AFSS, had to pretty much create their own proprietary documents to fulfill that role. Because traders, particularly if you're going to do an export like now, um, as we're coming into that deadline, you need these documents as proof of export. Among other things, you sometimes need them for um, you know, special procedures and other evidence. Um, the lack of that evidence was a bit of a glaring omission, to be honest. So I think most software providers now um, have effectively produced their own. Some will look similar because they kind of agreed a standard template, um, which the JCCC, part of HMRC, effectively signed off on. Um, but it was just a, a very peculiar issue very early on where people, and even now, some people still have this problem where they don't have the evidence that their entries are being completed. They're fairly sure they are because goods are arriving in the country and they're being you know, moved off the border and into their destination. Um, actually getting the documentary proof was more difficult perhaps than it needed to be. Uh, and finally, there was a thing about, as we mentioned a minute ago, there's some new CDS fields. So the ones I've cited as an example here are data element 413 and 85. And those are valuation indicators and the nature of the transaction respectively. Um, they had some shared DNA with early chief um, boxes, but for the most part, they were new and in some cases they were mandatory now where they weren't before. But these are the ones that ask questions like, is there an effect on the value of your goods because there's a relationship between parties? Uh, what that's getting at is the value you've declared on the goods you've imported. Or have you declared a low value because you've effectively done an interbranch transfer? Um, a lot of agents were, would basically see these data elements and when interacting with the clients, would just say, look, we're going to assume that the answer to that question is no. Um, there's no change, there's no effect on value because of that, so we'll submit the entry accordingly. Uh, a lot of traders weren't aware that agents were assuming this. Um, same for 8.5, similar scenario. Um, and in that case, it kind of meant that some eight, eight, some eight, well, traders were having their entries done incorrectly, basically, because they might have actually been doing branch transfers, but their agent just assumed a default state of no because the trader didn't say otherwise. So something to be careful of. Um, again, most of these new ones sort of centered around valuation and therefore they won't be as big of an issue on the export side. The export, you don't generally need to go into the same detail, but it was something to be aware of. And it's a general lesson that if you are using an intermediary, which as we've just seen, over half of you are, um, you need to be a little bit careful about the clearance instructions they have. And if they don't have any at all, uh, you might need to look into giving them some, because if there's cases where you need them to fill data elements in a certain manner, you're going to have to tell them because by default, they will assume uh, a certain set of data um, unless otherwise told. So next slide, please. In terms of key dates, um, obviously the main one is sort of the last one on the slide there, but we'll get to that in a second. Uh, you may not be aware, but you can actually start to do CDS exports now. Uh, as long as it's only through a GVMS location. So ones like Dover, um, Hollyhead, you know, the Eurotunnel, basically those kind of areas, um, you can actually do your export declarations now through CDS. Um, the TDR, or the test system for it, is live as well, just to know. Um, around May, uh, sort of June, we should expect to start seeing some letters from HMRC as well. So if you're a trader, um, you might get HMRC saying, prepare for certain deadlines if you haven't already subscribed to CDS, et cetera. So don't be surprised if you start getting that mail shot sent around. Um, but following that, we've got September, and that's when CDS exports will go live for 
every location, so not just GDMS, so all the main seaports, et cetera, you'll start to be able to do CDS export entries through those. Uh, and then finally, we've got November, so specifically the 30th, but that's the final mandatory deadline by which you have to have switched over to doing your entries through CDS instead of Chief. So basically what we're saying is that you can do actually start doing your entries early uh, and, and make the transition before that, particularly if you only do GVMS locations. Um, but the absolute last moment you can switch is November the 30th. Um, obviously, a lot of people have the question on their minds of, might that be delayed? Um, will they do an extension like they did for the import side? And which we, we can't crystal ball the future, but we can probably guess that the government wants to stick to the current dates. Um, they've already delayed it. The, the switch to November was a, was a hefty change as it, as it is. Um, but in, in my two cents, as it were, I think we'll, they'll have to see how they go with resolving some of the issues on the import side. It might be that they take longer than they would like to resolve some of those. Uh, if that's the case, we might see an issue. Um, equally, if there's a lot of industry backlash and people saying they're not ready to switch, the government may cave to that and, and, uh, and move over. But the thing you've got to bear in mind is that we're, we're a fair way in now. And I think the government would expect most people have plenty of time to get ready for this transition. So that's not something they would greatly like to entertain that people say we're not ready. Um, because we've got a few months, we've known about the switch for over a year. Um, so taking the hardline stance, that's kind of the view. It's look, you should have time to prepare. That shouldn't be the reason. Um, so yeah, if it gets postponed, I would say it'd be more a technical issue on HMRC side than sort of a trader requested delay. So um, just bear that in mind. I would very much operate on the basis that it will not be postponed further. Um, so just play it safe. And if you can make the transition, uh, I would start to do so pretty much as soon as you're able. Um, because the benefit of doing it early is if you need to learn CDS declarations, if you run into a problem, you at least have cheap as a backup at the moment. If you leave it till the 30th and afterwards, um, you know, you can go to do a CDS entry, discover there's a problem, either lack of knowledge in internally or actually a technical problem, uh, and you won't have chief if you leave it till that late. So I think it's general advice is, is make the switch as, as early as you can. Um, for that reason, it's, it's going to be a bit safer and it's going to give you a bit more time to adapt. Uh, so next slide, please. I might just uh, heads up on time if we could uh, yep. get to the next bit in about two or three minutes. Yeah, we'll wrap this one. That's all right. Next slide, please. So I referenced it slightly already, um, and hopefully we can put the link in chat for you. But most of the guidance for CDS on the note of completing entries is in Trade Tariff Volume 3. So Anybody that needs to find it, literally Google that or click the link if we put it in. You will have the link in the slides afterwards. Um, that will take you to all of the guidance where it tells you basically start to finish how to do an entry. Uh, next slide, please. The other site that you might be interested in is Trade Tariff Volume 2, aka the Global Tariff or UK Online Tariff, all means the same thing. Um, this is generally the site where you find your commodity codes, but there's a few links if you do search your commodity code um, that tell you how and where to do certain bits of CDS information. So just bear that in mind. Um, it's quite a useful tool for various reasons. It will tell you, for instance, certain document codes that you need if you know where to look. Uh, but next slide, please. Uh, and finally, we just got key takeaways. So next next slide, please. Um, this is just to summarize a, a few key bits of advice really related to the guidance as well. Um, but basically, if you come to doing your entries, reference that guidance first. Um, but when it comes to procedure codes, um, just be a bit safe on these. Uh, don't assume that your procedure code ends in treble zero. This is something that can change slightly more so for the exports. Um, commodities and documents, this is just general safe advice. Double check your commodity codes. Um, more so, if you're exporting, you generally don't have to worry about it too much, but if you do control goods, you might need an export license. Uh, make sure all parties are clear on the encode terms, a bit of general advice, but the reason I say this here specifically, um, CDS requires a bit more detail on encode terms than Chief did be aware of that. Uh, and finally, this is slightly relevant as, uh, as the government's just announced a few changes to it today, but do just consider a special procedures might be a benefit to your business. So that's things like customs warehousing and so on. Uh, but the final point really is if you're doing your own entries, um, just make sure you've got all the badge codes you need for the relevant CSPs. So just bear in mind that export inventory linked entries will need you to go through one of these softwares. So with that, I will hand back to Will. 
Thanks, Matt. A really good uh, recap, very good summary. So thank you for, for sharing that. Uh, on the next slide, you'll see we're going to just quickly run our second poll. And while we're doing that, we'll ask a couple of questions to Matt as well. But this one's asking, have you already start, or sorry, ready, can't speak. Have you already started using CGS to submit export declarations? Uh, got my uh, teeth back in my mouth now. Um, but we've had a question in from Elona who says, when it comes to import export declarations, will the, the change change customs procedure codes or will it be similar to what we already see in Chief? Uh, the easy answer is it will be broadly similar, but there's a few that have changed. So of note ma mainly is the standard export CPC code. Uh, in Chief, it was 10001, for instance. That does not work in CDS now. Uh, you will probably need 104000. Um, it's another one where you're going to have to check Total Time Falling 3, for instance, and just double check the section there on procedure codes and make sure your one is still there. If it's not, you have to go through the process of finding what its replacement is. Thanks, Matt. I uh, hope that's helpful, Elena. And a question from actually from, from a few people. Uh, Samantha has asked it, but so too has uh, Kate. And they're just asking around proof of export in um, in CDS. So it's what is the proof of export you can get from CDS? Uh, yeah, this, this circles back to the issue. By default, in chief, most people would use the C88 or the SAD that's generated. As I say, now uh, you'll have to double check if you're using an intermediary ask them and they should have a re proprietary replacement document as it were, which will fulfill the same function, it just might not look the same. Um, so on the spot, that's the one you're gonna have to go for. Otherwise you do have MSS reports and a few other reporting functionalities you can use instead. But the limitation there is you only get those, for instance, once a month or even less frequently than that. So yeah, the preferred one, if you're doing your own entries, check with your software provider if you don't have access to the document. Um, if you're doing an, if you're using an agent, um, yeah, just put a call in or an email to them and ask them have they got a replacement document for the chief um, CATA, and you'll need that replacement as your proof of export. Great, great, thanks, Matt. I hope that's helpful, Samantha and Kate. Just going to close and share the poll results now. So I guess not too surprising. We a lot of you haven't started using CDS yet for export declaration. Seventy nine percent, only eight percent of you have. 13% not sure. And I'm sure we'll see that change as we run more webinars on CDS in the coming weeks and months. I, I think with imports, it was around the kind of uh, one or two months before the deadline started coming that we started to see a real shift in that. So um, thank you everyone for answering. Honestly, that's really inf interesting for us to know. But at this point on the next slide, I want to uh, thank Matt. We'll be hearing from him again in the Q&A at the end of the presentation. But for now, it's my, it's my delight to hand over to Sam Blakeman from Customs for Trade, who's going to be giving even more information about some of the key consideration exporters need to make and uh, some of the software solutions as well, which are available. So Sam, over to you. Okay, great. So hopefully you can hear me nice and clear. Thanks, William, and thanks, Matt, for that information. So what we're going to look at now, um, and obviously Matt's provided some key update on what those changes are from a legislative point of view and uh, regarding the differences between the uh, Community Customs Code and the UCC and why that means uh, that CDS needs different information to, um, to make those de uh, export declarations. So what we're gonna look at now uh, from, uh, from our content is in regards to if you're using software to self file and i believe there was 25 percent were fully self filing uh, in the poll earlier um so uh and then a, a percentage were also um, using agencies and also self filing um your software needs to be upgraded and updated so that it can communicate from chief to cds so your software provider um, will be um, uh, doing declarations now uh, for imports into CDS and will be in the process of, if not already coming towards the end of, uh, migrating across to um, CDS for exports. So what we wanted to do was really to talk around uh, who C4T is and to give you some idea as to how we manage that migration with our customers, um, which would then hopefully be quite useful for you depending on who your software provider is. And of course, further to the 56% that, uh, that are using uh, an agent or a broker, um, they will be using a software to, um, to file on your behalf. 
Um, so there's obviously, they will have a uh, process in place in order to migrate you across. So it might be interesting and helpful for you to see how we do that from a software point of view. So next slide, please. Okay, so if we look at uh, lessons learned from uh, CDS imports of what went well. Uh, so from our view in regards to our migration of uh, our customers across to, to imports for CDS, um, one of the key things that went well for us was to do early client analysis. So obviously, as uh, Matt has already alluded to, there are uh, commodity co uh, customs co uh, procedure codes, sorry, that have, that have changed. There are lots of um, uh, documentary changes that have happened. And uh, we all know that filing customs declarations can be, uh, can, be <clears throat> can be very specific depending on what your commodities are uh, and what sort of ports you're using and that sort of thing. So to do an analysis of the customs flows, the ports, the commodities, uh, and to find out um, uh, the exact specific requirements of each customer early on uh, was very, uh, very good and beneficial for us in regards to making sure that we could assist them with that migration across the CDS imports. Um, one of the things we do at CPT is we have a lot of team collaboration. So we like to bring skills together from all the different departments. Obviously, we have people who uh, are involved in customs compliance and, uh, and customs legislation. Uh, but then being a software team, we also have uh, the product team and the, the developers and the uh, engineers and test departments who are making sure that all those different parts of the puzzle come together. Uh, and also collaborating with our customers um, in regards to their IT team as well. It may be that uh, there are new uh, bits of data that need to be required to fed in CDS that weren't already being used in chief making sure that they were holding that information or would be able to provide it. And another very key thing for us that went well was um, having that, that uh, relationship, that really close relationship with HMRC, uh, with the business rela relationship managers, um, so that we knew that if there was any customs related blockers uh, as part of that migration, we had someone we could go to straight away uh, on the inside of HMRC who could assist us with those because um, with the best will in the world, um, getting the migration of data across to the new system and performing that testing, there's always going to be, uh, as Matt mentioned earlier, some um, hot fixes effectively or changes that are required by uh, within CDS. Uh, so being able to communicate closely with our business relationship managers there meant that we could uh, work through those issues with our customers uh, and get those um, uh, sorted out quickly. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so CDS imports, uh, what what uh, could be improved? So um, I think there's there's a few things uh, that we learned from from the rollout of um, of imports, and one of the key things I think that Matt already mentioned too was in regards to um, moving uh, exports back. Uh, you know, timescales um, uh, got quite compressed with the delay uh, of imports, and of course uh, HMRC. Uh, moved um, the uh, cutoff of exports uh, from March through to uh, to November. So, um, getting that information from customs early on, uh, especially in regards to specific scenario scenarios or, or, or requirements like the birds, which is the bulk import reduced data set, which is uh, a particular. Um, uh, procedure that's not used maybe by as many people uh, it, it's definitely very beneficial the earlier we can get that information in uh, in the software community and the AFSS do a brilliant job in this in regards to uh, uh, taking the industry's um, concerns and requirements back out to HMRC and obviously HMRC feeds that back um, earlier checks on authorizations in CDS uh, as more validations are in place compared to chief so again, we, and I'll come on to it later, we have a program that we go through with our customers in order to migrate them across uh, to the new system. Um, but uh, having those uh, those checks on, on the authorizations uh, and validations earlier uh, allows us to pick up and, and be able to resolve those uh, as the customer looks to move to go live to uh, uh, switching over from one system to the other. Uh, and better timing to avoid holidays should CDS support the client scenario. So uh, it's quite obvious that one. So next slide, please. So a little bit of information about us as a, as a company. Uh, we were founded in 2004 um, and uh, Customs for Trade was predominantly a consultancy uh, company. 
So we were um, involved in doing customs authorizations and um, uh, customs consultancy and working in regards to helping clients with with connecting software and stuff to, to, to custom systems. And then around 2015, we started to develop a product. Um, well, the vision of the product was that it was a custom software tool that would be connected in multiple countries uh, for, for customs filing, which also gives us um, uh, multiple country upgrades to deal with, which we'll come on to later. Um, but then also a, a tool that would allow you to not only file declarations for imports and exports and transits, but also to administer special procedures, which Matt mentioned earlier, um, which I believe have, there's been some updates on in the budget, which we'll have to catch up on later. Uh, but to be able to run a customs bonded warehouse, for example, uh, or inward processing or outward processing within the same product that you actually use to do your, your customs declarations. And we've generally grown um, grown from them over the years and added different things. Obviously, around, 20, uh, uh, around 2020, there was a lot of expansion around Brexit. Um, and we also added in some additional teams, which I mentioned earlier, that we work with in order to make sure that we've got the expertise from different areas to aid with those transitions for these country systems. Next slide, please. So key changes, chief to CDS. If we just flip to the next slide, please. Uh, most of this has already been uh, been covered by Matt, but so just to summarise in regards to from a software kind of point of view, obviously we've got the new legal basis. We've moved away from paper. So um, in regards to creating those uh, those document that documentary proof, we needed to develop within our product and have um, you know the, the the documents that you can print off and generate. CAS will automatically create export accompanying documents and it'll create a version of the uh, the, uh, the C88. Um, so that's something that we've had to do to make sure that, uh, that our customers have those uh, those um, documents for their requirements. We also within the product will we maintain um, a repository of all the messages that are sent. So when you use uh, our software product to file your customs declaration to for example, uh, CDS imports now, we maintain the file that's transmitted out. We also maintain the, 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 the response from CDS, uh, and then we will also create those documents and that's all held uh, within, within the product for audit purposes or for different information. Obviously, uh, new data entry methods. So we've gone from boxes to data elements. So at the end of the day, a declaration software is an electronic version of of a form to gather the data and send it in we needed to change um, uh, and add those additional elements now we were quite fortunate at c4t in that because we're based uh, the company is based in in belgium we have offices in the uk as well uh, but we're connected to multiple countries that we already developed the customs declaration software based on the ucc so we were already um, using those uh, those uh, data elements that have now become uh, the standard uh, in the UK. So we kind of went from already on the other side and brought Chief along to it. Um, whereas obviously some software that will have been uh, older and developed in in the UK will have been from the uh, the old sad boxes and are now had to change over to the UCC. Um, obviously, we've already, Matt's already mentioned about the, the CPC codes, but something that needs to be taken into account is testing. Uh, and I've already mentioned the uh, the forms there as well. So next slide, please. Okay, so uh, this is kind of the key point here for us on a software point of view, just a bit conscious of time. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, we're connected in multiple countries. Uh, we're connected in uh, in the Netherlands and in Belgium and in Ireland and uh, and GB UK. Um, so, as part of that, you uh, as part of the MASP, which is the you know uh, getting this UCC um, standardization across all these different countries. Um, all, 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 many countries are, are, are changing their custom systems. So, in the UK, obviously, we have uh, Chief to uh, to CDS, and uh, Matt mentioned earlier that Ireland are, are doing it as well. Uh, we in, in the Netherlands, we have uh, AGS to DMS. So, we have quite a lot of experience in regards to the fact that we have to manage those migrations for our customers in our software product across multiple uh, migrations and, and countries. So this is kind of how we, we we do that from a from a um, 
a, a project program point of view. So again, we have that mixed team of uh, people with customers knowledge, product and services uh, to work with the customer. So we have a project initiation where we introduce our customers to the migration plan. And again, this is, uh, you know, the helpful information that Matt provided earlier, a summary of these are the changes, this is what we need to check, this is what uh, are going to be the requirements and the changes that you will experience. We then do a systems analysis where we review their data within our systems. And obviously, if we're onboarding a new customer that may have been uh, reporting uh, in a different software, uh, the same applies. So we'll review their data and the configuration, and then we update uh, the environment ready for testing to make sure that we can test uh, their real life information uh, for, for, for CDS. We provide system training and user acceptance testing. Um, obviously, this is key, as, one, uh, as Matt mentioned earlier, and I will show you on the, the next slide, I believe. We've moved away from boxes to data elements. Lots of people have very strong affinity to um, history with, with sad boxes. It's what we've used for, for years and years and years. Uh, suddenly, when we start talking about data elements, for example, box 44 now being split up, it can be quite confusing, so we provide training on that uh, and, and also as part of the acceptance uh, uh, training. Uh, we then set up a, a live test environment where we configure it all for the, for the customer's requirements. And then we do some smoke testing, which is effectively testing the major functions to make sure that it's actually then ready for the, uh, for the unique uh, user acceptance testing, etc., and to be signed off. And then, of course, hopefully, we have a, a, a smooth go live and the first declarations are, um, are declared onto CDS, which is what we did with, with imports. Uh, obviously, um, uh, ex CDS exports can be uh, started to be done now if it's GBMS. Um, and then once our customers are live, we then hand over to the support team for ongoing uh, software support. So next slide, please. So um, your migration journey, a bit of information, a, a bit of advice is what we, what we would say in regards to getting ready for the change. Um, obviously, speak with your software provider if you're using a software provider, as uh, a quarter of you probably are. Um, they should be providing you with a plan or information or timeline as to how this process is going to work, uh, moving you over. And of course, if you're using an agent, they will be doing the same with their software um, and should be able to give you some sort of idea as to when they're going to look to move you across, what additional information they might need from you. Um, and with that, then you need to agree the plan for migration. So if you are uh, an exporter and you are uh, looking to move over to CDS, agree that with your provider or agent as to, as to what those timelines look like and what the requirements are on both sides. And then key thing as well is to test all those flows thoroughly. Uh, the more you test, um, you know, the, the, the smoother the migration is going to go. Obviously, there's, you know, if you've got significant uh, variation in, in commodity codes, there could be lots of different variances that need to be tested. Uh, the more testing you do, the better. And then when you actually migrate, it should hopefully be really smooth. Next slide, please. So again, just uh, very quickly on this one, uh, I've already mentioned it, our products connected to multiple countries and then we also connect to carriers and customers and partners and suppliers. Obviously, we connect to the CSPs as well. The idea being there is one data set. And with the UCC model, it makes this idea work. We have one set of data which allows you to file in different countries. Um, uh, uh, CAS will allow you to uh, create a, uh, an export out of GB, out of UK, uh, and use that one data set to create the import into Belgium on the other side. So you don't have to create two different messages for it in and out. And next slide, please. So just uh, one of the last things here uh, about the UCC, and I did mention one of the things that a lot of people do like uh, and we're quite uh, keen on because it really does help with this transition is that in our user interface, we list the data elements with the old sad boxes next to them. Now, obviously not every sad box has a relevant data element and some are split up, but we just try to give you that, that uh, almost cheat sheet in the UI uh, that might help you to, to, to make that migration from moving, uh, you know, from box 44 into multiple different data elements. So that's kind of uh, one of the things that works for us. And it works really well because in the other countries, we're already using the data elements. So um, it, it proved quite well. So next slide, please. And finally, uh, just to wrap it up, uh, so the CAS product, again, as I've already said, we do uh, multiple um, parts of the, of, the, of the journey within the product. 
uh, imports, exports, procedures and transits, uh, multiple countries with compliance and automation. Um, you know, there are lots of software products out there that can uh, that can help you to to do this and to gain ownership and control of your data. Um, you know, and I would I would say to those 56 percent of you that uh, are using brokers, uh, it's worth going out there and looking what products are in the market. Now, there are a lot of really good software products out there that can um, that can help you to sell file. Uh, there's also always probably going to be, always, well, always will be a case for, for brokers who um, can help do that heavy lifting and have that expertise for certain commodities. But uh, if you're in the 56% that uh, uh, and have not looked into self-filing, maybe it's something to worth doing uh, because uh, there's a lot of value that can be, can be got from self-filing. So next slide, please. And that's me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sam. Thank you very much. That was a really good, uh, really great presentation. Lots of information there. I hope everyone has found that useful. Um, we have a slightly short on questions on the floor are going to be. So I, I don't know if Matt and Sam are available to, to hang on a, a couple of minutes after three, just so we could got a bit more time to do some more questions. Uh, but yeah, apologies for slightly overrunning, but uh, lots of information, a very important topic. Uh, we do have a couple more polls. I'm going to just put them on very briefly and get going with the Q&A while these are on. Uh, hopefully those questions this poll question will be relatively self-explanatory. Um, just while people are answering that first one, Sam, if I can start with a couple of questions for yourself. We've had a question from uh, Mark, which is, would I need to access CDS if our business only uses agents to complete our export or import clearances? Okay, that was from Mark. Sorry, what did you say? Um, yeah. So um, if, if you're using an agent, then uh, you, know, you would still need to register for CDS um, and you would need to give them um, the authority to, uh, uh, to, well, to grant standard authority for the agent to do it. But um, in regards to uh, filing the actual, actual declarations, the, the agent, straightforward or broker should be making those declarations for you through whatever software product that they use, whether it's in-house or somebody else's, um, to file those declarations. But you do need to make sure that you're registered and you will need to grant them uh, the standing authority to uh, to do that on your behalf. That's really important, I think. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Uh, I'll just quickly share the results to that poll while the next uh, question. Uh, I'll bring Matt in with a question now. We want one to come in from Tilly. Uh, which is what do we need to do on CDS if we're temporarily exporting goods, i.e. sending goods to Spain for a trade show? Uh, de depends to a degree why you're temporarily exporting. Um, there's a few ways around it. I mean, you can look at the things like carnets, but on the CDS front, it's probably easier to look at procedure codes or basically temporary export. So trade shows is actually covered under procedure codes as one such example where it will allow that. Um, so yeah, we come full circle really. You need to just double check the the new procedure codes. They're, they are listed on Trade Tariff Volume Three if you want to look there. Um, but generally, you'll find them under the um, well the heading of temporary export. So that's one option. As we say, the more complicated, slightly non CDS option is carnets or, or other such measures. So musicians and so on will will use something like that quite often. Thanks, thanks, Matt. Uh, and thank everyone for responding to that poll. Though. That's actually a slightly more prepared than I, I would expect at this stage. That's that's really interesting. Um, just while we're doing that, I'm going to slightly flip the order a little bit. I'm just going to ask for the next poll as well while we're doing the questions. Um, so yeah, I mean, obviously, thank you once again to Customs for Trade for supporting today's webinar. If you do want to find out more information about the software solutions they provide uh, on submitting declarations uh, using CDS and various other customs uh, aspects as well. Do respond uh, yes to this poll and uh, hopefully that will be really helpful for you. It's, it's been great uh, featuring you today, Sam. Um, well, people answering that poll though, so let's do some more questions. Um, so a question came in from Craig, which is a really good one, which is, do I need to register for CDS again for exports if I've already registered for CDS for import, or sorry, for imports? Uh, Sam or Matt, do, do you want to take that first? I, I can do that one, Sam, if you're all right. Yeah, yeah, no, if you want to. Yeah. Um, straight answer is no. Uh, if you've already signed up for, for imports, uh, you're basically good to go for the exports. Um, obviously, it goes without saying, if you never signed up for the imports, you will need to go through that process now uh, for this. So no, don't worry if you were already signed up because you uh, you import products, you should have a much less uh, sort of admin intensive time of it this uh, for this deadline. 
And just out of interest, I mean, what is the process for signing up to CDS for the first time like? Is it quite difficult or is it simple enough? That's, um, as we said uh, on some of the slides earlier, if you're a company that's got multiple URI numbers uh, and branches and things like that, you can run into some difficulty. So just expect that. Um, otherwise, if you if you have a single URI number, a single unique taxpayer reference in Government Gateway, you'll probably find it quite easy. Uh, you just have to go into the government link, which is, or you can literally just Google it, um, subscribe to CDS. Um, and you basically go through a series of things there. It can take a little bit of time. Um, and then just go through the process of adding your uh, agents to your financial dashboard if you need them to use your methods of payment, for instance. Um, but generally speaking, you can probably do it in the space of, you know, a day. Just <laughs> if you've got all the records to hand and all the relevant num um, yeah, numbers like your URI number and so on. And again, yeah, if you're, uh, if, sorry, if you're uh, um, with a software provider and you're doing that migration, that should be part of um, uh, the yeah. preparation of that, the start of the program in regards to giving you that advice and showing you how to how to register with CDS. Great, thank you, thank you both. Uh, if you, you can just put it on the next slide, I think that'd be great, thank you very much. Um, so questions just come in from Karen, which is about how CDS and NCTS5 relate for transit movements. Um, NCTS5, I understand, is the updated version of the current transit system. So I don't know, Matt, do you want to start on that one and then uh, open it to Sam? Yeah. Um, yeah. So there's currently, I believe, we're on NCTS4 at the moment. Uh, NCTS5, I think, is actually scheduled for a launch at a similar time this year uh, as, as the CDS exports. Um, the straight answer is they're not really intrinsically related. Technically, Transit is a separate, uh, both customs process and software um, to what CDS deals with. Um, you'll usually find, uh, I don't know if it's the case, Sam, I'll hand over to you in a second, but customs um, software platforms will offer a functionality for both, um, but it'll be a separate package quite often. But uh, yeah, over to you, Sam. I don't know how you guys uh, deal with that. Yeah, so it's so similar, as you say, you know, it's connection to to, to separate systems. So um, we handle those sort of migrations just as we do with uh, migrations in other country systems effectively. Uh, you know, we're doing upgrades from uh, DMS, uh, from AGS to DMS in the Netherlands. Um, NCTS is seen as a similar program, obviously, but slightly different nuances. But um, we run that as a, a as a migration program, as we would do for any other software upgrade. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, we've had a few people asking about whether there's a trade address rehearsal system again for exports. I know there's one for imports. How do we access this? If so, but, uh, Seb is one of the people to have asked that. Uh, Sam, do you want to start on that one? Yep. So there is a trade address rehearsal service now. Um, in regards to how you access it, you should contact your software provider for details. Um, at CPT, um, we automatically enroll our customers uh, as part of that um, uh, that program of, of migration. Um, so yes, if you're uh, looking to access the, uh, the, the the trade address re rehearsal service, you should contact your software provider, and they will um, provide access to that when it fits the the rollout program that they've got planned for your migration. Good stuff. A question has come in from Max about uh, will the new single trade window replace CDS? Um, and another system potentially coming in. Uh, Sam, do you want to start on that one? Good question. <laughs> I don't know if there's been any updates in the in the budget live on on single window while we've been talking, but. Um, yeah, so so I mean the the prem the idea of see of single window is that it will be one access point that will allow you to send data to multiple um, government systems. Uh, CDS is the customs system, uh, so CDS will be obviously uh, the idea is that data going into single window that's customs relevant will go to uh, will go to um, to CDS. And then hopefully there will be connections into things like IPAFs and uh, and uh, various other uh, government systems, all from one from one window. But I don't see that. Um, I, I may be wrong on this because not uh, all over the policy. But um, CDS has been built as the engine for declarations. Single window is a way of combining that information and sending it to multiple uh, disparate systems effectively. Uh, 
Yeah, I, it's one of them that we always have to put the caveat that we don't know the detail of it yet um, because it's very much a pilot or, or early scheme. But as it currently stands and from the language that we have seen to date, I think it's a fairly safe assumption that CDS will remain. It might have slightly different procedures and processes that you can utilize because of the window. Um, but as of now, you can kind of assume that both will run in tandem, to be honest, in some form or another. My understanding as well that a single window can be any sort of system. It's, it's not necessarily a distinct system, so it might even be that CDS is kind of a way into the single window. In a, in a yes, industry. yes, could be. Yeah. Um, had a, a couple of questions in from Dale, but I'm going to do this one, which is just asking about permissions. So he says, does a new permission need to be issued even if your third-party broker has permission to operate and cheap? So do you have to recreate the permissioning once you're going to move over? Uh, um, one for Sam, I think, on the software side. Yeah, yeah, on, on the software side, um, no. Um, you would be if you're if you're using our software to, or if you're using software to file your customs declarations. Uh, you've got that authorization. Uh, you're self-filing, so you don't need to um, uh, give that that uh, that standing authority. Um, so I wouldn't believe so in regards to how the the brokers uh, the brokers work, whether they see it as the authority you've already given for them to file on your behalf. It's different if they're filing for CDS. I don't believe it would be, but uh, I can't answer for that, Mark. I don't know about you, Matt. Yeah. Um, on on the, the sort of non-software side, so permissions, as it were, the way it's generally done is a separate document called a, a power of attorney or, or standing letter of authority, which can be which is outside of, of CDS or Chief. Uh, a lot of people might want to issue new ones to be bulletproof because the old one referred to uh, Community Customs yeah. Code and a few other bits of legislation. Um, so you might need a new updated form which refers to the basis of that representation being the Union Customs Code and actually for the UK post Brexit, the Taxation Cross Border Trade Act 2018. Um, but generally speaking, you won't need to do new forms or anything like that. Um, and if, if the question was around authorizations for simplified procedures or anything like that, um, that should carry over as well. Yeah. I've did two more questions, conscious of time. Um, so a question from Christopher, uh, is the NES government gateway for chief going to have a replacement, i.e. will there be an option for entries to be proposed, processed for export direct through a government portal? Okay, so... Uh, um, um, yeah, so can you make direct uh, uh, declarations on CDS without software effectively? Um, I mean, obviously, TSS has been doing that for a while. Uh, I'm going on to, see, on to, on to CDS. Right now, um, my understanding is there isn't uh, the option to make uh, export declarations straight to CDS without using a software provider. However, I do believe that a web front end is in development. Uh, that will allow you to create exports to CDS a bit like NES. Uh, Matt, you might be closer to that uh, development on that on that front, but as far as I know, it's not live yet. Yeah, the, the, there was a throwaway line uh, in an update last month that they are planning to do something like that. Um, at the moment, you well, as far as you plan on the basis that you have to go through a software provider, even if it yeah. is um, the portal of someone like Destinate, the ones who give you your badge codes for the inventory linked ports, they would generally have a part of this, their offering, which is a platform through which to do entries. But at the moment, there's no gov.uk, if you will, um, portal through which to submit entries. Um, but that's not to say there won't be. I think they are working on it. One last question is actually follows up on TSS, interestingly, it's coming from Gary is asking, will the Windsor framework uh, impact the requirement to use CDS for uh, Northern Ireland goods under the protocol? Uh, Matt, do you want to take that one? This this is another one that um, while the Windsor framework was, you know, it had a lot more than we expected in it and, and it announced a lot of what it would change. What it was short on was the detail as to how exactly that would work. Um, I would say, no, I think you'll still need uh, CDS and by extension the TSS a good degree. Uh, I think talks are ongoing about that. But because of the nature of green light versus red line, uh, for the red light ones particularly, you will pretty much still need to do declarations. Um, but as it currently stands, even for the green light one, it's suggested that you'll just have a sort of trusted trader scheme, but you'll still have to do a stripped down basic entry, as it were. So I think in both cases, you'll still need it. Um, but it's entirely possible that the, the green light, particularly, will have an extremely reduced data set by comparison. 
watch this space, I, I think. Yeah. But um, on that note, uh, we've gone the, the full five minutes over. So I think we'll have to start wrapping up. Uh, Ewan, if you want to move back a couple of slides just to the side we finish Sam's presentation, I think that'd be a nice one to finish on. Uh, but yeah, once again, just thank you to, to Matt and Sam for answering your questions. Uh, I hope you have found that useful. Just to say, also, we didn't get to every single question today. We, it's very rare that we can just because of the time allocated to these webinars. Uh, but we will be doing more webinars on CDS in the coming months. Uh, and we did a Q&A webinar before the imports deadline. And I'm sure that might be something we replicate as we get closer to the November deadline. Um, but yeah, thank you once again to Sam and Matt for presenting today. We hope you have found the webinar in general useful and informative. A reminder that we will be sending the recording of today's webinar with a copy of the slides in the follow-up email, which you should get in the next day or so. Please get in touch if for any reason this email doesn't come through to your main inbox. Uh, we're about to have a short break on the webinar front, uh, but are hoping to announce a few webinars in April in the coming days, including sessions on the much anticipated target operating model as and when that's announced, as well as sessions on the UK's post-Brexit trade agreements. We'll also be wanting uh, additional webinars on the migration for CDS for exporters, as, as mentioned. Uh, you can go to export.org.uk for more information about our upcoming webinars and activities, including how to join as a member of the Institute and the educational and consultancy services we provide to businesses and individuals. But for now, thank you everyone for joining us today. Do let us know what you thought of today's webinar as you exit and do the exit survey. But for now, bye-bye uh, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you all. Okay, bye-bye. Cheers.